You know, a few days ago, I was driving home, uh, and I, I really don't know why it was. Tucker was, was with me, and it was just me and Tuck, and our, our son Tucker, our youngest son's seven, and, and we're driving down, the, uh, driving down the road, and, and Tuck says out of nowhere, Dad, do y'all have snacks in y'all's worship too? <laughs> and I thought, you know, we don't. And I don't really, I was like, I got to talk to Alexis. I mean, because you can't tell me this wouldn't be better with some goldfish crackers and a little juicy juice or something. I mean, it would make for a better day. We got to look into that. You know, we'll find, Bustle can find the money somewhere. I, I, it, it, it reminded me of how our kids are watching and we don't even really, we, we, we know that, but we forget it. We just forget. I wonder... I wonder if Carl, Carl was a preacher many, many years ago. I wonder if Carl ever realized who was watching when he, when he came to church. A few weeks ago, Steve, uh, I think it was last week, Steve Carell said something in this worship that really stuck with me when he said it. He said, what kind of thoughts would people think about God based on watching you sing? I don't know. I mean, I hope good, but I don't know. Watching me worship, what, what, what would people think of the God that I serve based on, on how I, I worship him? I wonder if Carl thought about who was watching him in worship because there were people watching. Carl died, and his boy was only five years old when, when Carl died. And his boy went on to be what most people consider the most profound atheist in human history, Frederick Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche's daddy was a preacher. If you don't know who Nietzsche is, I won't go into all of it this morning. We don't have time. But most philosophers credit him with pretty much all of secular humanism as the root. He's the one that said God is dead. Meaning not that somebody killed God, that God is no longer needed. He pioneered the thought that really it's you need to do whatever you want to do and serve yourself first because in the end, that's really all you've got. So is that alive in 2018? I mean, Friedrich was watching. In fact, they, I, I, there, it's, it's been reported that he was asked, why do you vehemently oppose with hatred, it seems? Where, where is this vehement opposition of Christianity? Where did it come from? Do you know what he said? That's what he said. I never saw the members of my father's church enjoying themselves. He was five. Can you imagine if that guy got saved, where we would be today? Can you imagine how different universities would look if that guy came under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine where academia would be today and what they're teaching your sons and daughters at UT and what they're teaching your sons and daughters at Ole Miss and what they're teaching your sons and daughters all over this country? Can you imagine what would have happened if that guy came under the influence of the Holy Spirit? I never saw members of my father's church enjoying themselves. Joy, hey, listen, man, joy matters. Joy matters a lot. We talked last week, if you haven't, if you didn't get to, it, it was phenomenal preaching. You need to go back and listen to it. It was, um, in, I just really wanted to see if y'all were paying attention. Um, in the podcast on joy versus happiness, today we're going to talk about a little deeper on, on joy. And what it looks like, it matters. I, there's this, uh, every time I read Hebrews, there's this verse that, that really hammers me. And it hammers me because I, 
I, I can't get past the way they describe Jesus in it. This is what it says in Hebrews 1. We're not going to go there today, but I want you to see this because it says, about the Son, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Isn't it, isn't it fascinating that of all the ways Holy Scripture could describe Jesus and the anointing that he lived under, he was described as being anointed with joy. I mean, how critical. You think that doesn't matter? It, it's the ball game, man. We're going to talk today about where joy comes from and where it starts. We know where it comes from. It comes from Jesus, but we're going to talk about where it starts. So open your Bible to John 15. Gospel of John, verse 15. Now, this is a long discourse that Jesus is going on with the disciples. He covers a lot of stuff. You could spend a year in John 14, 15, 16, and 17 and not get anywhere close to exhausting the thoughts there. John 15, verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father's glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then he changes the conversation a little bit. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So Jesus talks a lot there about a lot of things, but there's this idea of what it means to abide as kind of the birthplace of joy, that, that happiness and joy are two completely different things, and that joy comes from, the, he keeps coming back. Anytime you're in the Bible and, and there's a repetitive phrase over and over and over, you know, they didn't have Google, and they, they didn't have text notifications. In those days, the, 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 it was an oral culture, so anytime that you hear something in the Old Testament or in the New Testament said over and over again, they're trying to make a point so that you don't miss it. And what he's saying is that abiding, and then he tacks joy there in verse 11, that there's something connected, that abiding is directly connected with joy. So I want you to understand that, that this is the foundation of what we're talking about today, that to abide is the place where joy begins. Now, let me tell you what, what abide means in the language, okay? Let's look at it. It is, it is a state of being. It is not inactivity. And you really got to get that down. To abide with God is, is not a, a, a state of just kind of holy passivity. Like, you know, if I just sit here long enough, Jesus will stop by. That's not the idea. No, it, it, to abide with God is a state of operation. It is a way in which you walk. It is a way in which you talk. It is a way in which you think. It is a way in which you speak. It is the way, it's what you let into your mind, and it's what you let out of your mouth. Right? That, that abiding is, is a way of, of being with God. It is a oneness of operation in effect. In fact, Jesus even prays in John 17, if you want to go read it sometime, in John 17, 21, he even says, Father, I pray that they will be one just as you and I are one. He talks about that communion sense, that that abiding is a place where we are all together. And from that, today, we're going to talk about why joy matters. 
from the idea of abiding, we're going to talk today about why joy matters. Because it matters a lot. It matters a lot. And if you're taking notes, and I love that you take notes at Clearview, I'll tell you something on a side note. Let's, let's, let's time out for a second. I want to tell you something. I, I've said this before, but, you know, psychologists tell us that you forget 85% of what you hear in the first seven minutes, which is, <laughs> for a guy in my world, that's just the death statistic. <laughs> All right? All right, but, but the, here, here's the truth. You need to keep a piece of paper in your Bible. You need to bring your Bible to church with you, for one thing. And then you need to p- keep paper in there and a pen because here's what's going to happen to you. God's going to say things to you. You're going to be reminded of things. The Scripture's going to be written down that you're going to pull out one day. Things happen in, in your mind, and you need to write it down. And so I want you to write this down. Joy is a reflection of the change Jesus made in me. All right? Joy is a reflection of the change that Jesus made in me. Look at what he says in verse 11. All of this stuff, all this abiding, all of this keeping of the commandments, all of these things, things that matter. And I've said all of that to you. In other words, verse 1 through verse 10, I said all that to you that these things I have spoken so that what? My joy is in you, and your joy is made full. In other words, you're not going to have your joy made full if my joy isn't in you. It's not possible. It's not possible. So why does it matter? It matters because joy is a reflection of the change that Jesus made in me. There's a, a couple here with us today. Today is their 23rd wedding anniversary. That's them right there, Scott and Kathy Coon. Look at that. Yeah. That was a lot of hair ago, Scott. Y'all come on up here. Um, I've got nothing but grace and sympathy for dudes losing their hair, man. I'm going to tell you right now. Y'all, the other day, I I bumped into Kathy at... uh, at, at a restaurant with some of our Clearview ladies, and, and I made them a... St- Kathy, well, tell them what you're doing with your degree right now. Uh, right now, I'm um, attending Southern Seminary studying biblical counseling. Yeah, which basically means she psychoanalyzes everybody she meets. I'm just going to tell you that right now. All right, it's not fun. All right, I'm just, I'm, uh, that's just a prerequisite. I've already told her. I'll tell you where the weird places are if you'll just not analyze it all the time. All right. Um, so I asked her some psycho- psychological question about her degree field, and then we went on a 25-minute run on, on stuff. That, you know, it's like asking a preacher what they're preaching on on Saturday night. Don't ever do that, ever. You're going to get the whole thing, man. And uh, so I asked her about some of that. And, and it, but it was in something that she said, it, that you said, Kathy, that, that I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. So I, I, I want you to, there, there was, but there was a time in life where it it really wasn't great for y'all. And so take us back to that place, y'all, and and then walk us forward from there. Okay. Uh, So personally, uh, I was raised in a great home, good Christian house, was in church a lot. Uh, I became a believer at an early age. But as I moved into adulthood, um, I just was very self-focused, very selfish, um, and I carried that into our marriage. And um, I began to be a scorekeeper. So I was very much of the mindset that marriage was 50-50, and if I was given 51%, then she wasn't doing her job. And so um, that's obviously not a healthy place to be. It tends to make things a little hard a little at home difficult. from time to sure. time when you keep sure. score. Uh, and I'm sure I, my, I have no experience with that. I, I know you have. But. <laughs> and I'm certain my scorekeeping wasn't even accurate. So it's whatever I thought the score was, right? <laughs> right. And so um, I just noticed that, um, again, I was real selfish and, um, and was very self-focused. And I was getting, I was seeking happiness um, in people and, and places and things and not seeking joy from Christ. And uh, it just let, it got, and each year of our marriage, it seemed to get worse. And, and this feeling of hopelessness kind of started to settle in my heart. And uh, it was really tough. 
And that was, and, and that carried y'all really almost the first decade of your marriage, right, yeah. Kathy? It's about it, your it 10. Yeah. What, what was it like for you in, in that season? Um, you know, I came in uh, to marriage, um, you know, saying that I, I would have told you that I was a Christian. Um, but looking back now, when I reflect on those years, um, there's certainly no fruit from that time in my life. And um, I was just... Um, I was very hard-hearted woman, um, very self-focused. I focused. can't imagine you being. That's just. You, I, that's not I your was, way. Um, you know, I, and I, I, I just. Mean, really, I was. I, mean, it's, yeah. I was thinking about this during the first service. You know, I, I used to have some friends in high school um, that my nickname was uh, Steel Heart, and no yeah. I don't even know that. Yeah. So even, it just it, it remind in, in the first service that just came back to my to my mind my memory, but. Um, so I, you know, I lived a, a life of, um, honestly, I just wanted it to be easy, um, and I just wanted to be content, and I just wanted to be happy, and um, I started to speak and act based on whatever thought or feeling I was having that day, um, as if my thoughts and my feelings were truth, and um, you know, those things and, and selfish behaviors and um, just selfish thoughts crept into our marriage um, at such a gradual pace that we just didn't see it in the ins and outs of the everyday. Um, and it wasn't until year 10 or so that we were just like, what, like, what happened? How did we get here? How did we get so far away from God's design for marriage that we feel hopeless? Like, we just... I couldn't, I couldn't fix him, um, and I tried, um, and I couldn't fix myself. I just, I didn't know how, and um, so it just seemed kind of like, you know, maybe the worldview is just easier. Mm. Yeah, get out. Yeah, take, I mean, take, take the, just check out. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people that, and I, when y'all said that in the first service, you made it 10 years, Michelle and I made it about four uh, we, uh, we always have our, Michelle and I always have our radar up for anybody that's been married three to seven years. Because it seems like all of our friends that have been divorced, it was in the fourth to, to seven year range, somewhere in that. And even there's some statistics behind it. You should study, you should, your dissertation should be on that, on the, what happens in year six, some weird mojo. And the, the um, we, we, I very much resonate with that because I think we were doing the same thing and didn't even realize we were doing it. And, and it, but then, then you, you, you guys, um, I, I think there, there were, from hearing your story, and we didn't rehearse this. I mean, I, I didn't really know what I was walking into this morning until right out of the gate. We just wanted to talk about their journey. But there was a turning point. Yeah. And that's what, it, it, that's what hit me in the restaurant. when you, you made this comment that something happened with the way you were approaching the Word of God and how, what it did to change the dynamic of the family. Um. So into that um, really, really low point um, when I was, um, you know, I, I think up to that point, I think I had a lot of worldly sorrow, you know. Um, like poor me stuff, you yeah, mean? I, yeah, poor me, but, you know, just like, I'm so sorry for what I said or what I did. But, you know, in a, um, in a very self-righteous way, I think. Um, and at that point when I realized, um, I can't, like, I can't fix this. Um, and honestly, like, I don't even know how to, or now I don't even know if I want to. Um, you know, I was just very broken and I could feel God working on me, um, in such a strong way. And, um, I actually, I was on my way to work. I was teaching high school and I was on my way to work and I just, I pulled the car over and I was just sobbing and, and I just, um, I just prayed to the Lord. I'm like, Lord, I, I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, you're my last stop, um, at this. And, you know, knowing now he should have been my start and, and not my last stop. And I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to change me. And um, I just, I know that I need to come to the end of myself. Um, so I give it to you. Like, what you know. Um, and at that point, I, I found hope. Like, I just, I had that hope that was found in him and the work was a process like the restoration of the marriage like that that, that was takes a pro time. that takes time it does yeah. but i had hope in in christ and my 
in-laws had given me this Bible a few months before for my birthday. Um, and I'm pretty sure I opened it for the first time um, that day when I got home from work. And um, it was in that first time just reading the scriptures that the Spirit just illuminated the Word to me. And it was, it was something that wasn't just stories that I'd heard from my past. It wasn't just a book of history and um, fake characters, you know. Um, this was about the gospel from beginning to end, and it's a story of redemption and restoration and God's love. And I began to pray, Lord, please, will you just search my, search my heart, search my heart, not his, like search my heart and show me the wickedness of my ways and lead me to the everlasting so you, you way. Actually, you actually began praying different. I, I Instead did. of fix my husband, fix me. Yeah, and, and yeah. honestly, I really wasn't, to be honest with you, praying before. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that was my thought process. Hoping maybe. Yeah, that was yeah. my thought process. And yeah, there wasn't much prayer for me up to that, up to that point. And um, God just, um, in such an unbelievable way, just started to transform my heart and renew my mind. Um, and I learned that all that I needed for faith in life was found in his word and through the spirit that he would give me the strength um, to do that turnaround, you know, yeah. um, and to repent in, in a way that there is a turnaround and a change of heart and a change of mind. Yeah. And, but in, we, I, learned, I learned from the first service what there was things you didn't know that was going on. I didn't, yes. And so um, I kind of thought, you know, God and I, like, we're doing this process alone. And, um, the Fix Scott project. Yeah. yeah that, um, and yeah. so we didn't um, – another piece is we weren't really um, – actively involved at all in church at this time. Um, We had no community. Um, As a matter of fact, this is actually the first day that we've ever shared our full story um, ever. And so we walked through this, uh, you know, alone. But in that, in this time, I thought it was just, it's just me and God, you know, and, and he's just working on me and he's just working on my heart. What I didn't know is at the same time, God is doing the same thing in Scott's heart. Yeah. And so I was kind of like Kathy, I was at the, just the end of my rope. And um, I had been praying some, but certainly not consistently. But my prayers got more consistent. Um, They got more passionate. And the most important thing is the focus of them changed from, God, will you fix her? Or even will you fix my marriage to search my heart and show me my sin? And there was plenty of that. And it, through that process, again, not knowing that she was doing basically the same thing at the same time, it's really cool, even today, you know, 13 years later to hear the story because it's, it's just so cool how God works. And I love when he shows off like this. And, uh, but it, for the first time, I started to see just a little glimmer of hope. And I can remember uh, going through that season and feeling hopeless and it was devastating. And so to, for God to show me just a little glimmer of hope really changed uh, things for us. So when you look at where it was versus where it is, I mean, I, I'm, it's, it's funny how, I mean, I'm not, I'm not joking around. I, it's, it's hard for me to, to think of Kathy Coon as like what, the steel what? The steel heart. The steel heart. Yeah, because if you've been around Kathy much, that just doesn't fit, you know. It's hard for me to think of. But what, what, what happens is when, you know, it, you, you guys both said it, it's a slow, it doesn't happen overnight. You wake up and you go, how did we get here? What, what, what happened? And so you spotted it. Obviously, the Lord began to change it. What would you say has been right or wrong, or, or not without overthinking it, I guess what I'm saying, the, the biggest change? So we, we kind of hit the first 10 years. The last 10 to 13 years, uh, I know there's been a lot of change, but what sticks out in your mind is the, the, the big ticket items. Yeah, so, and it is, we, we talk about this all the time. I bet once a month, twice a month, we will look at each other and say, isn't it awesome what God's done in our lives and our marriage? We do, and we've never done it in front of this many people, but <laughs> um, I would say that, um, Again, God worked on me, and so my focus wasn't on her, it was on me. But what I've seen in her is just 
I mean, it's a miracle. It's awesome. And, and who the Lord made her today, which is who he designed her to be, and to see how, she, how well she loves others and she loves me and our kids. And she is so selfless. And, um, and she does all of that without wanting the glory herself. She wants it to point back to Christ. And I think that is a, an inspiration to me and to people who know her because um, we've been through valleys and we've been through some tough times. And, and to see what God can do when you allow him to work in your heart and, and seeing what he's done with Kathy through grace is just amazing. What about you, Kathy? I know you've seen changes in him. Um, you know, I used to not want to look back there um, because when I look back there, I'm like, um, like, how did, like, you know, I still am like, how, you know, how did that happen? But, um, and, and we always say, like, I don't know who those people, like, I don't even know who those people are anymore. Um, and, and that's, that's God's work. And, um, man, I, we're at 23 years and unless God takes us home earlier, then I'm looking forward to 50 plus more with this guy. Um, and I have just seen... He's well insured. So <laughs> he it's, is. It's, it's, it's okay. But very accident prone. So, um, <laughs> well, well, this but, is what y'all don't know. See, 23rd wedding anniversary today. He was trying to do some push-ups, and it didn't go well to impress her. And it, yeah, it, it didn't happen. Uh, but I've just seen, I mean, looking back over the last 13 years, um, you know, just in his life, and the more that I see him, um, diving into the word and learning more about who God is and God's love and God's grace, the more I, say, I see him um, model that um, to me and to our family and to so many others. And just to have such a desire to serve and just a, such a desire that other people will have the hope and the healing and the redemption and the restoration um, that he found and that I found and that we have found. Scott, and you do model that well, Scott. You do, you, you, you with, with what both of y'all do with, with young adults. And so the, the point of bringing them up here was simply to let you know, um, you know, one, change is possible. Don't think it's not. I, I, I mean, I guarantee you, I don't know what, if it was a Tuesday or a Thursday or a Sunday, but when, when you, that day that you pulled over and whenever day you hit your bottom, at that moment, you, you thought, that it's, there's just no, this isn't going to end well. In fact, it's just going to end. I mean, and, and that's, that's the path most people take. Change is, is very much possible. But what I also want you to know is that it, I know for a fact that there are some of you in this room that are at the 10-year mark the Coons are at, and, and you need to know you're, you're not by yourself. There are people that have walked that road and can tell you the way out of it. But they, they're, nobody can help you if you don't reach out. But you're looking at um, a, a, a big testament of the, of the power of Jesus Christ, of what happens. I often think, you mentioned both of you when you got to the end, and you, you, he, you, you said it really neat. Um, he was my last stop when he should have been my start. But I often wonder if, if when you get to that point, God's like, all right, here we go. You know, um, because I'm able to, to kick in now. Finally, thank you, you know, that you bottomed all the way out. And, and we can, then you're desperate. desperate Desperation is a great motivator. It really is. And, and when you're desperate from that place, then things change. So, hey, I, listen, it, it, I didn't know this. Y'all had never really shared this. It takes an insane amount of courage to talk about your marriage in front of a lot of people you don't know. Well, let's give them a, a big hand for that. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that very much. Change is very much possible, and let's talk about joy is a reflection of the change Jesus made in me. So let's talk about why, why that matters a little bit. Here, here's the, the first I'm going to share with you is simply this. Is, it's about appetite, okay? It's about appetite, that, that his joy brings me a new appetite. It brings inside me new desires, Look at what Jesus said in John 15, verse 10. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You'll operate in my love. You'll exist in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see, oneness with God. We look at things like commandments as, as heavy burdens. We look at things like commandments as these, these heavy backpacks on our, on our back, and, and, and they're not because, you see, here's the reality. He's not talking here about conformity to a standard. You've got to understand that. He's talking about oneness, and oneness breeds obedience. Oneness breeds obe obedience. Jesus himself said, my burden is easy. My yoke is light. He's not talking about conformity to a, a set of standards. He's talking about communion. And that's why he prays what he prays in John 17, that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Because with oneness, obedience is a natural outflow of it. Think of it like this. You know, Michelle and I have been married going on 21 years, and I can choose not to have an affair on Michelle because it's morally wrong. I can choose not to have an affair on Michelle because it would break, you know, commandments. It would set my family in, to, on a path that, that would be destructive. I can choose not to have an affair on Michelle because with, it would be wrong against God. And all those are good and accurate reasons. Or I can choose not to have an affair on Michelle because I love her so much that I don't want to break her heart. You see, same result, different way of getting there. Different way of getting there. When, when Jesus abides in me, it's not that sin isn't attractive. It's that sin isn't as attractive as it used to be because I know the payoff. I've chewed that bubble gum. I know what it tastes like. It's not that I'm not tempted to do anything any other person isn't tempted to do, but I, I remind myself all the time of the payoff because the way, listen, when Jesus abides in you, I want you to know something. Substitutes taste awful. Substitutes taste awful. Substitutes for peace taste awful. Substitutes for joy taste awful. Things that don't go inside, that aren't supposed to go inside, they don't feel right for a reason. You see, Jesus said, I've spoken these things to you that your joy would be full. Now, I, I quoted earlier Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1 is, is actually a quote of Psalm, Psalm 45. So this is what Psalm 45 said. You have loved righteousness, talking about Jesus, and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. The oil of joy. What, see here, you know, now listen, as far as I can tell, there's nowhere in Holy Scripture, there's nowhere that I've seen that the anointing of God falls on anybody outside covenant. Okay? Nowhere out, I, you know, you see God using all kinds of people, even the Babylonians and stuff like that in Scripture. But the anointing is for the people that he places it on. And it's fascinating to me that he anointed Jesus with oil. But look at the first part of that verse. We talk about appetite. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. You see, there's a new standard. Joy, joy testifies to the change in me. Joy testifies to the change because I'm not looking to it. When I look at what Jesus says about abiding, I'm not looking to a fallen world to give me what it could never give me in the first place. No, I'm looking to the joy giver. That's how I'm going to set the standard. But that's not the only thing joy does and why joy matters. I want to tell you one other thing. that joy, his, his joy gives me the ability to love well. If you're writing things down, write that down. His joy gives me the ability to love well. I find it really interesting in this whole passage that Jesus is going back. And this is a long conversation. It's like three chapters long. One long discourse from Jesus. And, and He's talking about the vine and the branches, and he's talking about the abiding love of God, and, and, and he gets off into the commandments, and then he makes this change in verse 12. And this is my commandment, that you love one another 
just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. It's interesting that, he, that, that Jesus puts love, he positions love in the conversation with joy and obedience. Well, that's not by mistake. No, because you see, you understand, when he abides in me and when I abide in the Father, his love in me gives me the ability to love when I have no capacity for it. When I have no ability for it. His love is a reflection of that in me. You know, every time I see a painting, uh, I, I, I don't go to museums. I mean, I do love them when I go, but, but every time I see a, a, a very good painting, I don't think that much about the painting. I always am curious to want to meet the painter. I mean, who could paint that? I could never do that. When I see a photographer that just has such an amazing uh, talent, I don't think so much about the picture. They captured that like I was standing there. You see, art is a reflection of the artist. Every time I hear a song, a well-written song, I'm always stunned at how in three and a half minutes somebody can change my mood. It's, it's stunning. It's always a reflection of the heart of the artist. You see, when we have the abiding love of Jesus Christ, it changes the way I look at other people. Do you know that was the, that was the first uh, indicator for me? To, to love different. That was the first time that I ever, when, uh, learning to love was the first time that I ever knew that actually something had changed in me. I was a, a senior in high school. Uh, I was about 17. And there was one of my classmates that I hated. I mean, really. I mean, hated. I know we use the word hate. Oh, I hate broccoli. I hate asparagus. You know, or I hate turnip greens, which that's, that's, quali- that's qualified. You can do that. I, I, but I mean real hate. I, I grew up with this guy. We played Little League baseball together, played Babe Ruth together, played high school sports together. He was one of the meanest individuals I've ever seen. The things he would say, to, he was one grade ahead of me, the things he would say, the way he would act, when I tell you that I hated him, honest. I really didn't, if he had died in a car wreck, I don't know that I even would have thought about it. I had, no, I had you know, the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is indifference. That's where I was even past hate. I didn't even care. I came to Jesus, this guy had gone off to college, and um, I came to Jesus in the fall of my senior year in high school, and I was at a, as, as at a basketball game one night, and sitting in the student section, and he, he, it was close to Christmas break, and in he walks through the threshold of the door, and he comes up in the student section, and he sits just two rows in front of me, and the entire time. All I could do was stare at the back of his head in disbelief of what was happening in my heart. Because the only thing that I could think about was I wonder if Jesus could change him like he changed me because I don't hate him anymore. I don't hate him anymore. And I had never felt that in my life. I mean, I I could probably talk to you for 20 minutes and give you adjective after adjective to describe the level of indifference I had for this person. And it was gone. It was gone. And I didn't have it anymore. And that was the first time I knew, wow, I don't have the capacity to do that. I didn't want to do that. I never had a need to do that. It didn't even matter to me. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at this man, and I'm going, I don't know how to articulate any of this. 
So I didn't even bother talking to him. Because I don't know, I didn't even know what to say. Because it would have had to start with, you have no idea how much hate lived in my heart for you. Some of that was jealousy. Some of it wasn't. Some of it was deserved in my mind. But, but either way, it had been built for years and years. I watching you how he treated everybody, including me, and, and I'd never seen a person act like this and be like this and think like this and talk like this to people. And, and I'd, I'd built all that up, and it was gone. I didn't have the capacity to do that. You see, when you abide with the Father, he changes things that you couldn't change on your own. Uh, one other, probably 20 that I could tell you, but I'm just going to tell you one other about the joy of Jesus. It, it gives you a new countenance. It gives you a new countenance. I love what the old King James says in Psalm 21. Look at what it says. Talking about Jesus, you can show it. For thou hast made him most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceeding glad with thy countenance. The countenance of God rested on Jesus. Now, where is Jesus? He abides in me, right? He abides in me. So the joy of Jesus lives in me. His presence actually affects me. Think about Moses. When I read that this week, I thought about Moses. You know, and if you don't know the story of Moses, maybe you, maybe you don't go to church a lot or something, you maybe you haven't ever read it in a long time, maybe you've forgotten it. But Moses, when he went and talked with God, his face Physically, his physical face was so bright from the manifestation of God that the people, that he had to put a, a shroud or a veil on his face because they couldn't look at him. It was almost like looking into the headlights of a vehicle or maybe that you have someone with a bright light shining in your face. The people couldn't look at him because of the presence of God physically affecting him that much. You see, the, the joy of the Lord reflects on your face. And this is what I, I mean, I've only been at Clearview, you know, roughly about nine, ten weeks. And what, what I've noticed, there's not many. There's a couple of you, though. You're saved so You need to tell your face. You need to tell your face because it's needing it, right? Listen, you guys. Jesus talks about fruit right here, right? That if you're in the vine, it's the will of the Father that you produce fruit. So you see an apple tree with no apples on it, something's wrong. Because the, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Joy. Joy. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. The proof of the Spirit is joy. And if you don't have any, something's wrong. Something's wrong. It's it's. Not normal. It's not normal. Now, I didn't say that you had to go being some weirdo and corny and, you know, you're just constantly, you know, entertaining. I, I didn't say that. You need to be all of you, whoever God made you to be. But I'm going to tell you, that needs to show up. It needs to show up because if it's not there, let me tell you something. I'm not kidding either. Show me a person that claims to profess Jesus we all go through sour seasons, no doubt. But if you profess to know Jesus, I need to be able to look at your life, and you need to be able to look at mine and see fruit. The positive fruit that comes out of the vine. And one of those is joy. It's not normal. I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it. Without joy, you misrepresent the very nature of God to the world. Without joy, you misrepresent the very nature of God. What did he anoint Jesus with? The oil of gladness. The oil of gladness. Don't mis misrepresent God. Listen, his reputation matters to him. Don't misrepresent him to a fallen world. If you're in the vine, there should be proof. There should be proof. Joy is a reflection of the change that 
Jesus made in me. 